The AIM-54 Phoenix was the US Navy's first long-range radar-guided air-to-air missile, built to defend carrier groups from waves of Soviet bombers. Its only launch platform was the iconic F-14 Tomcat. With its powerful AN Org-9 radar, the Tomcat could track 24 targets and fire six missiles at threats more than 100 miles away. This is the story of what was once the most advanced fleet defence system on the planet. The 1950s were a time of rising Cold War tensions, and with that came some serious new threats to US naval forces. Soviet bombers like the Tu-4 and later the Tu-16 Badger carried increasingly dangerous anti-ship missiles. The problem was that ship-based radar range was limited by the radar horizon. And with incoming missiles screaming in at supersonic speeds, interceptors had barely four minutes to launch, climb and intercept the bombers before they reached striking distance. One proposed solution was to just keep fighters in the air 24-7, but that was never really going to work, given the fuel-hungry jets of the era. The Navy needed an aircraft that could stay airborne longer, and an ability to detect threats from much further away. The Navy's first attempt at a dedicated fleet defence fighter was the Douglas F-6D Missileer. Designed as a subsonic, long-endurance interceptor, it used the new Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P2 turbofan engine. This allowed it to loiter for six hours, more than 150 nautical miles from its carrier. Armed with Bendix's long-range Eagle missile, it looked effective on paper. But from the start, the Navy had concerns. The missileer had range, but lacked speed and agility. Once it fired its missiles, it would be easy prey for enemy fighters escorting the bombers. Skepticism grew quickly, and by the end of 1961, both the F-6D Missileer and the Eagle Missile Programme were officially cancelled. Despite doubts about the Missileer, the Navy still needed a true fleet defence interceptor. The next effort came with the F-111, born from the 1960s Tactical Fighter Experimental Programme, which aimed to create one aircraft for both the Air Force and the Navy. The Air Force's F-111A Aardvark, designed for long-range strike missions, and the Navy's F-111B, intended to fill the fleet defence role. General Dynamics led the overall programme, but for the naval variant, they teamed up with Grumman, a company with decades of carrier experience. Both versions used the Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engine, carried over from the cancelled Missileer project, but now fitted with afterburners. It was the world's first production afterburning turbofan, marking a major step forward in jet engine technology. Grumman shortened the F-111B's fuselage to fit the confined space of an aircraft carrier deck and slightly extended its wingspan to increase lift and improve low-speed handling, essential for carrier operations. The jet was built around the powerful AN Org-9 radar system, which was developed alongside the missile that would become its main weapon the AIM-54 Phoenix. The missile had its roots in an earlier Hughes project, the AIM-47 Falcon, which had been designed for the cancelled XF-108 Rapier and YF-12. The AIM-47 had shown a lot of promise in testing though, so instead of scrapping it entirely, Hughes adapted the design into what became the AIM-54 Phoenix. It carried over the AIM-47's core concepts, but in a larger airframe with four cruciform fins. It worked with the Org-9 radar to get mid-course updates and flew a high-altitude lofted trajectory to extend its range. Together, the Phoenix and Org-9 gave the aircraft the ability to track up to 18 targets and engage up to six at once, something no other US fighter could do at the time. However, the aircraft had some major issues. It was heavy, underpowered and lacked manoeuvrability. In light of air combat experience gained in Vietnam, these shortcomings were increasingly unacceptable. Even after several attempts to lighten it with redesigns to the control system, the airframe was consistently overweight. Any reductions were negated by the inclusion of a heavy escape capsule for the crew. 
In the end, it turned out to be a sluggish, underpowered aircraft that simply couldn't deliver the performance the US Navy demanded. During congressional hearings in March 1968, Vice Admiral Thomas F. Connolly famously summed up the problem when asked if a more powerful engine could fix it. There isn't enough power in all Christendom to make that airplane do what we want. Just two months later, both the House and Senate Armed Services Committees voted to pull funding. And in July 1968, the Department of Defence officially cancelled the F-111B. Anticipating the F-111B's failure, Grumman had already started work on alternative fighter designs. In response to the F-111B shortcomings, the Navy launched the Fighter Experimental Program to find a true carrier-based interceptor. Grumman's entry, the Model 303E, offered a more agile and capable solution tailored for naval operations. And in January 1969, it was chosen as the winner. The result was the F-14 Tomcat continuing Grumman's tradition of cat-themed names. The Tomcat blended long-range interception with real dogfighting capability. It was equipped with an internal 20mm M61 Vulcan cannon, along with AIM-9 Sidewinders for short-range and AIM-7 Sparrows for medium-range engagements. At its core was the powerful Org-9 weapon control system paired with the AIM-54 Phoenix missile, carried over from the F-111B. Grumman refined the design with a smaller antenna and upgraded features, allowing the F-14 to track 24 targets, display 18 in the cockpit and engage 6 simultaneously, a capability no other fighter of the era could match. Its design also incorporated the variable sweep wings and the same Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engines. Although lighter than the F-111B, the Tomcat still ended up being the biggest and heaviest fighter to ever fly off a US Navy aircraft carrier. The AIM-54A would enter service with the US Navy around 1974. It weighed about 1,102 pounds and carried a 135 pound high explosive warhead with a proximity fuse. This meant it didn't need a direct hit to be effective. It was launched using a pyrotechnic charge that ejected it from either a Lao 93 or Lao 132 launcher before the rocket motor kicked in. The F-14 could carry up to six Phoenix missiles, four mounted on pallets under the fuselage and two more under the glove stations. But a full load was heavy, over 8,000 pounds including the launch rails, nearly twice the weight of a standard Sparrow loadout. That much ordnance pushed the F-14 close or just past its safe carrier landing weight. For that reason, Tomcats usually flew with a mixed loadout, typically two to four Phoenixes backed up by Sparrows and Sidewinders. Either the pilot or radar intercept officer could fire Phoenix missiles, and the Rio had a large tactical information display in the back seat to manage everything, something the pilot could also monitor. The Phoenix had a few different guidance modes, depending on the range. For long-range shots, it would get mid-course updates from the Tomcat's Org 9 radar while climbing to somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 feet and flying near Mach 5. The thinner air meant less drag, which helped it reach its impressive range. At about 11 miles from the target, the missile would switch on its own active radar for the final approach. This phase was known as going pitbull, and it meant the missile no longer needed guidance from the launching aircraft. The crew could turn away, switch targets or engage other threats without compromising the shot. But the Phoenix wasn't just for long range. During closer engagements, it could be set to go pitbull right after launch using the missile option switch. This flexibility made it a surprisingly versatile weapon. In 1972, work began on a simplified variant of the Phoenix, designated the AIM-54B known as the Dry Missile. This version featured a sleeker design and eliminated the onboard cooling system to reduce complexity. However, only seven test units were produced before the program was cancelled over cost concerns. The only upgraded model to enter service was the AIM-54C. Introduced in 1986, it replaced the AIM-54A's analog electronics with digital systems, greatly enhancing its performance against both high- and low-altitude anti-ship missiles. The redesign also made the missile smokeless, 
more reliable and easier to maintain by reducing the parts count. During its time with the US Navy, the Phoenix was only used twice in combat. The first incident happened on January 5, 1999, when two F-14 Tomcats engaged a pair of Iraqi MiG-25s southeast of Baghdad. Each Tomcat fired a Phoenix missile, but both failed to perform as expected. The rocket motors didn't ignite properly and neither missile reached its target. The second engagement came later that year, on September 9th. An F-14 launched a Phoenix at an Iraqi MiG-23. This time, the missile launched successfully, but the MiG managed to reverse course and bug out before impact. Although the Phoenix never scored a combat kill with the US Navy, that doesn't mean it wasn't effective. Like many Cold War-era weapons, its real strength was in deterrence. In a Soviet technical manual from the time detailing foreign aircraft, the F-14 was classified as their highest assessed threat. Iran was the only other operator of the F-14. Despite losing US support, it ended up being the only country to successfully use the Phoenix missile in combat. According to aviation historians Tom Cooper and Farzad Bishop, Iranian F-14s scored at least 78 kills with the AIM-54 during the Iran-Iraq war. In some cases, a single Phoenix brought down multiple aircraft. In an engagement on January 7, 1981, a single missile reportedly shot down three MiG-23s and damaged a fourth. After the revolution, the US cut off Iran's access to spare parts and maintenance support. Despite part shortages being a constant struggle, the IRIAF managed to keep its F-14s and AIM-54s operational. But by late 1987, Iran had fewer than 50 usable Phoenix missiles left. One of the biggest issues was the missile's thermal batteries, which needed regular replacement and could only be sourced from the US. Iran eventually found a black market supplier, but at up to $10,000 per battery, keeping the Phoenix flying wasn't cheap. Iran kept its F-14s operational through a mix of smuggled parts, reverse engineering and eventually domestic production. Their efforts culminated in 2013 with the unveiling of the Farquhar 90 a missile widely seen as a reverse-engineered, modernised version of both the AIM-54 and MIM-23 Hawk. Today, both the F-14 Tomcat and the Phoenix missile remain in active Iranian service, though only in limited numbers, and primarily in non-combat roles. In mid-June 2025, Israeli airstrikes destroyed at least five Iranian F-14s. The arrival of new Russian-made Su-35 SE fighters in late 2024 suggests Iran is starting to finally phase out its F-14 fleet. The US Navy officially retired the AIM-54 Phoenix in September 2004, just two years before the F-14 Tomcat itself was phased out in 2006. By then, its retirement was expected. The Phoenix was a product of an earlier era. Large, expensive and built specifically for a platform that was reaching the end of its service life. In the years since the Phoenix was introduced, missile technology had advanced significantly. The Navy was moving toward more versatile, multi-role aircraft like the F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet, neither of which could carry the Phoenix. Instead, they were outfitted with the AIM-120 AMRAAM a newer, more compact missile designed to fit a wider range of aircraft and mission profiles. While the AMRAAM doesn't quite match the Phoenix in sheer range, it makes up for it by being lighter, cheaper and more adaptable to modern tactics and systems. In short, it was a better fit for the evolving needs of 21st century air combat. The AIM-54 Phoenix was a Cold War weapon through and through. Engineered to take out high-flying Soviet bombers long before they could threaten US carrier groups. It shaped how the Navy thought about air defence for decades and gave the F-14 Tomcat, one of the most iconic fighters of its era, its long-range punch. Built for a specific threat and moment in history, the Phoenix was, for its time, in a class of its own. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing as it would really help me grow the channel.